is Zach Gleamer. I'm technically a PhD student in the economics department, but I'm also a digital humanities fellow here at Berkeley, and I have a research agenda looking uh, using statistical techniques to analyze historical texts. This is a somewhat unusual talk for that reason. I, my, my formal training is in statistics, um, though uh, I had an undergraduate major in philosophy, and that's how I've spent a lot of my time being here. Today's talk is called Old Testament New Tricks, Using Translation Events to Examine Latent Belief Categories. So to give a sense of what I have in mind, we're going to start with Kant. Um, so in the Critique of Judgment, right, so 18, this is 1790 Germany, okay, that's where we're going first, 1790 Germany, uh, Kant in the Critique of Judgment uh, categorizes pleasure into three types. Right, so we start with sort of uh, what he would think of as the sort of lowest quality or lowest type of pleasure, of agreeableness. Um, colloquially, this would be food and sex. Uh, right, these are sensory pleasures, uh, things that you would call enjoyable, delightful, or pleasant. Um, uh, right, on, on the sort of opposite end of the pleasure spectrum is what Kant calls good pleasures. So this would be conceptual or ethical pleasures. You can imagine an apple that like perfectly typifies the way apples ought to be, right? It's a perfect apple, it's exactly right, right? Kahn would say the pleasure of experiencing such an apple is, is good. Similar, indeed, to the kind of pleasure you would feel walking down the street uh, and seeing someone give charity, right? What you're taking pleasure in is the fact that an object is of a certain type, in that case, of the type of giving charity and has nothing to do with the sensory experience of the object in itself. Kant thinks that the experience of the beautiful is somehow in between these two, that there's something sensory as well as something uh, conceptual or identificatory um, in the experience of beautiful things that feels pleasant. And so things that you would describe as stunning or pretty or handsome would fall into this third category of pleasant looking objects or pleasant feelings that you get from objects. So what I'm going to take from this exercise of categorization is just the presence or the existence of these categories, what I'm going to call latent categories. So people have pleasures all the time, and they don't necessarily actively or, or consciously categorize those pleasures into these types. Nevertheless, somewhere in the back of their mind, it's not hard to believe that people do feel differently about these pleasures. And perhaps as they were describing what was pleasing about certain events, they would use language differently to describe pleasures of different types. So for instance, uh, just narrowing our focus to pleasures of the beauty type, you could imagine objects that you would uh, say instance some of these words but not others. For instance, you would use the word handsome to describe men, in typ typically, and not women. Though maybe there are some women you would call handsome and you could explain why you would call those women handsome but not other women handsome. Why you know, some people are pretty, some people are attractive, some people are comely or lovely, etc., and not others of these categories. There's a sense in which language inherently blatantly categorizes pleasantness, right, into all of these different uh, uh, words with each word representing a category of sorts. And if you were to uh, push someone on why they would use one of these words in a given uh, instance, they would be able to explain to you why this is the right word for this instance, even if when they, when they immediately assigned the word, they didn't already have that explanation in mind. So what's the project here? I have a lot of old text. And I'd like to learn something about people's latent categories. Right? So something that I'm interested in is whether different groups of people, or different people altogether, I don't know, people in 17th century Germany and the contemporary United States, or different communities in the same country, whether these people have similar latent categories, whether they're uh, in some sense matching the same words to the same feelings, or categorizing those feelings latently in the same way. The way in which I'm going to test uh, whether people are similarly latently categorizing, in this case, pleasure, is by using translation data. So think about the act of translation. Right? A translator sits down and has a text in a, a, a second language, a, a, what I'm going to call the origin text. And they have to move that origin text into their own vernacular. 
So think about what that would mean. They have to go word by word, and in each case, determine which word in their vernacular they would use in this context to, uh, to match the word in the origin text. And in different contexts, the same word might be translated into multiple words in the vernacular. So what I'm going to do is learn something from translators' decisions in each case of which vernacular word to choose when translating the same origin word. And in particular, I'm going to be using translations from Hebrew. Two translations, uh, translations from the Haggadah and translations from the Old Testament. Okay, slowly wrapping your minds around this, what's the scope of this project. There are two Hebrew words that I'm going to be particularly interested in for this project. One is the word tov, which is typically translated as good, though it, it more specifically describes um, something appealing or good about an object. So it's less frequently used to describe moral behavior, and more frequently used to describe objects that are, I don't know, good in some sense, appealing or pleasing in some sense, often describing them as beautiful in some sense. So the word tov appears more than 550 times in the Old Testament, uh, as well as dozens of times in the Haggadah. And you can sort of use each of these uh, appearances of, as the word tov as a data point. Right, a translator comes in and 550 times over the course of translating the, the Old Testament or the Tanakh, they, they translate this word tov, and so in 550 contexts, we know what the translator thinks of the word tov. Right? So they're blatantly categorizing the word tov, or, or all 550 of these contexts, into groups. These are the ones that today we would call beautiful. These are the ones that today we would call pleasing. These are the ones that we call attractive, etc. And then another translator comes in, in a different country, or a different time, a different place, and similarly categorizes those same 550 tobes, those same 550 contexts, but will use different, language, uh, different words. In particular, if they're in a different country, they'll be translating into a different language altogether. That's irrelevant for, for this project. What's relevant is which words are grouped together. The Tob in Genesis 3.12 is using the same word in, say, the King James Bible as the Tob in Exodus 3.14. That must mean that there's some similarity between those contexts, between the object being described, that doesn't exist between objects of other kinds, right? So the other instances in which the word tov is translated by this particular translator or translation team into appealing, attractive, etc. So the second word, so that, that's sort of a general idea of what I'm using with tov. You could do something similar with yafa, which is typically translated as beautiful. Uh, and in fact, most of this presentation I'm going to be focusing on yafa, which appears 70 times in the Old Testament to describe nice-looking objects. Okay, so what am I actually doing here? Here are nine circles. These nine circles each represent, uh, in this example, I'll just lead us through an example using the, the Old Testament. So each of these circles represents a verse. Right? So for instance, right, circle number one represents this verse, Psalms 48.2, in which the word yafa is translated as beautiful. So I put beautiful and bold there. So it's a beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north of the city of the great king. Right? So in this context, in describing this city, the word yafa is translated as beautiful in the King James Version of the Old Testament. Alternatively, in the Song of Songs 2.10, right, a version of love poetry, the word yafa similarly appears, but here my beloved spake and said unto me, rise up, to my, rise up my love, my fair one, and come away. Yafa is alternatively translated as fair. And it's not hard to see that these two contexts are very different. Despite the fact that they're both using this word yafa, they, they're describing very different kinds of things. And the translators recognize this when they choose in the first instance to, to translate yafa as beautiful, and in the second instance to translate yafa as fair. So, now we have nine verses. And in each of these verses, we know that yafa appears and is translated into some word. And so we could summarize everything that we care about in the King James Bible, the King James Version, with these circles. So these circles could represent the, the combinations of verses 
that all use the same word in the King James Version. In particular, it might be the case that circles 1, 2, and 3 translate yafa into beautiful, 4, 5, and 6 into fair, 7, 8, 9 into, 9 into well-favored. Right? This is a latent categorization of these nine instances of yafa in the Old Testament. Right? We know that the, the King James translators thought there was something similar about the objects described as yafa in 1, 2, and 3, that was not shared by objects 4, 5, 6, which themselves shared something else similar, for which reason they were translated as fair. So here we have the King James Version of the, of the Old Testament, and now we can look at another translation of the Old Testament. So in the blue you have the, the categories, the latent categories of the King James translators, and in the red you have the latent categories of the New International Version, a Protestant translation of the Old Testament from the 1970s. And so you can see that those categories are quite different, right? So it might be the case that while the King James thought that one, two, and three shared something and called that thing that they share beauty, alternatively, the New International Version translators might have thought that one, four, and seven make more sense to categorize together, and they call those things handsome, right? So it might be that different aspects of context are, are relevant to different translation teams. And so in this case, the New International Version is picking up on totally different information about these, uh, these verses than are the translators of the King James Bible. Indeed, there's a sense in which these categorizations are maximally different from each other. Right? No two objects which are, which are similarly categorized in the King James Version are also similarly categorized in the New, in New International Version. Right? They're, they're completely at odds with each other, wholly orthogonal. Right? You can lay them on top of each other, and that, that makes this clearer. Right? No two objects are grouped together in both translations. No two verses are grouped together. I'm Alternatively, sorry. yes, please. Any questions? Yeah. Um, are you taking into account the fact that the translations were done at different periods in time? Yes. And then people would just use different words? That's right. So the key thing to notice about these circles is that I'm not paying attention to which word the circle represents. What I care about is which verses are grouped together. So what's nice about this, and a feature of this kind of analysis, is you could compare the categorizations, say, of 17th century uh, uh, English translators and 17th century German translators. Right? Despite the fact that they're translating into different languages, I can still extract the latent categories from each and compare the two. There's a problem that comes from switching across languages, as well as switching across times. One problem here is that there might be different amounts of vocabulary available to translate. So it turns out that uh, the Luther translation of the Bible, which is a 16th century German translation of the Old Testament, um, is a very literal translation. Almost every time that the word Yafa appears, it's translated into the German word Schön, which means beautiful. And so there's a sense in which Bibles like that provide very little information about the latent categories of individuals, just because there, wasn't so, there weren't so many choices for the translators. I'm identifying all of what I can get, right? I'm, I'm getting as many categories I can, as I can using differences in translators' choices, but if there are no differences, I can't identify anything at all. So one thing I have to keep in, uh, keep in mind and take into account as I'm doing uh, empirical exercises that compare the categorizations of different Bibles is to sort of take account or control for the fact that different languages have different amounts of available vocabulary, and that translators are, are differentially restricted in the vocabulary that they can use. Um, so today's talk is not a technical talk. I'm not going to go through the algorithms that I use to, uh, to measure differences between categorizations. Uh, that's for another time. Uh, but uh, I guess suffice it to say, that, uh, that I think I have a, a, a clever and useful way of, um, of measuring differences across categorizations of verses that uh, is indifferent to the amount of vocabulary available to translators. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the way it will work is uh, if two Bibles, or in this case, let's say the Luther Bible, provides very little information about, uh, about certain verses, then I'll just say, okay, we have no evidence that, these, that, that those categories are different from the categories of, say, 20th century America. That's not to say they're the same. It, what it really means is just that. There wasn't enough information in the text 
to, to prove to us that there are differences in these categories. So, um, so uh, thanks for that question. So, uh, so okay. So we can imagine more translations of the, the Old Testament. So here we have the Good News translation. And you can see that, uh, well, it looks like one of the categories lines up. So it might not be the case that one, two, and three are translated into the same word in both of these Bibles. But at least they're translated similarly. They're in the same word group um, uh, in these two translations. Whereas, again, objects four through nine, uh, there's no matches between them. Alternatively, you could have a Bible like the New King James Bible, which claims to be an update of the King James translation, but actually changes very few of the words. And so what you're left with is Bibles that look empirically identical to me, right? You end up with exactly the same categorization, just because the translators change so little about the text. In fact, when you look at the 1917 JPS translation of the Old Testament, so this was the first large-scale Jewish translation of the Tanakh in the United States, there was an earlier translation, the Leeser translation of the uh, 1870s and 80s, conducted by one man, but that was a very literal translation with very little uh, uh, content to it. The JPS translation of 1917 was essentially just a rewrite of the King James Version. So they go through, and every time uh, the King James Version says virgin, they switch it to young woman, and uh, you know, some other theological differences between Jews and Christians, but otherwise there were very few changes in Jewish translations of these texts all the way up until the 1980s, when the JPS uh, commissioned a complete new translation of the Bible. <coughs> okay, so, uh, so now that we have this sort of idea, what, what am I working on? Now let's switch gears and think about what is the value of using this kind of tool to examine Haggadot. So think about the way a Haggadah works. Haggadahs, uh, there's, there's a tremendous number of Haggadahs. So, right, so just here in the Magnus, I was in the storage room hunting around for possible projects, and I stumbled upon 1,000 Haggadahs um, in the Magnus collection. Right? So this means there's tremendous variation um, in uh, 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 these Haggadahs, from 17th century German Haggadahs through contemporary Haggadahs from all parts of the country. And what you see is that Jewish communities, in the tendency, all translate their own Haggadot. Right? Everyone has their, their favorite Haggadah, uh, different cities translate them, different religious or political groups translate them. So you can get tremendous variation in these translations. And so what this tool, right, this empirical tool would let us do, is differentiate between the latent categories of these different Jewish communities. Right? It could give us a sense either of some latent similarity across these Jewish communities that might not have been known previously, or alternatively could point out substantial differences in how these communities think about nice looking things or uh, uh, more ethically good things or uh, uh, sensorily appealing things that might not otherwise have been known. So, okay, so how does this project start? I found a hundred a thousand Haggadahs. I say found, but of course, I don't know, Julie and Francesco have always known they were there. Uh, I found them for myself. And the first goal is to figure out how many of these Haggadahs are unique. So I write a quick program to go through the catalog and throw out duplicates of Haggadahs, and we end up with something like 450 uh, unique Haggadot in the collection. The next step is to randomize. So what I do uh, is, I, I, I again, wrote a quick algorithm that assigns random numbers to each of these uh, boxes of Haggadot, and then we, we chose boxes at random and started to digitize them, with the goal of using the digitized text to, uh, to, right, to conduct this kind of algorithmic analysis. Um, so, I'm going to hit pause on that thought for a moment and turn this presentation over to my research assistants, uh, Aiko and Clayton, um, who will tell you some more about the Haggadot in this collection and the activity of digitizing them for this project. Uh, it's all you guys, and there's the mic. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. I am Aiko Gonzalez, and this is my research partner, uh, Clayton Hale, and he's going to talk a little bit more about our digitization, digitalization project. Hello, everybody. My name is Clayton. Again, I work with Aiko. Uh, we're both, uh, we both worked at the Europe um, program at the Magnus last semester. And what we did in this project is 
we fully digitized over 30 uh, Haggadahs here at the Magnus. Um, to do this, we had to take into account the various aspects in which uh, the various Haggadahs had. Um, some were printed on very different materials, uh, different contrasts and colors. Um, for some were more fragile than others. Um, some were hard bound, some soft bound, some open left to right, some open right to left. Uh, and then as we dived into scanning these Haggadahs, uh, we found a deeper story underlying uh, the different books um, that we were scanning. Um, some that told the story of American foodways, um, some that told the story of uh, modern American art, and um, some of charity. Uh, the one of the most interesting ones I thought was the Maxwell House collection of Haggadahs we have here at the Magnus. Um, starting in 1932, um, I found that the Maxwell House uh, printed these, made these Haggadahs uh, to appear, appeal to the Jewish community um, in the United States, uh, advertising uh, coffee as uh, something clean or kosher, uh, other, not a legume, not a bean, uh, something that could be uh, consumed during the Passover. Uh, so that's just one story that I found after um, uh, scanning the various Haggadahs and taking into the account that uh, they were something more than just a book that we were scanning. And that was one interesting story that I found. And then I'd like to pass it over to Ike. And um, like Clayton said, we did find a lot of interesting backstories. And some of the ones that, since I'm, I'm, I love visual, I love art, is kind of the transformation that you see between the illustrations that we've come across to as well. The one in the front, the one that's printed on the little black book, is actually illustrated by a modern Jewish artist. Um, who kind of takes a, a, a spin of a contemporary artwork and look at the illustrations. Uh, you can contrast with the one that's right next to it, the little one. They're both the scene of um, Moses and Aaron uh, approaching Pharaoh, but they're really different in context when you look at them, especially uh, the black one is illustrated by Rabbi Rashtin, and he takes a very modern approach where it's like they're faceless. It's very, it's very interesting to see kind of the transformation of of the illustrations. Uh, in contrast with that, the one here in the back is actually illustrated by Ezekiel Schloss, who's actually featured on, here in the Magnus too as well, out there in the front, and kind of seeing the different illustrations and stories. And of course, too, as well, the colors, the one that's open here is very starkling, you know, the contrast of colors and everything. So when it came to digital, digital, digitalizing, <laughs> digitalizing these, we had to take into account all of these um, all of these different complexities of how best to make sure that the text that we can OCR it, that, that Zach would be able to still be able to compare and contrast the words. So with that, we will pass it back over to Zach. Yes? What does the digitalization, whatever it is, actually mean? Is it just taking a photo or is there someone that can identify in yeah. yeah, great question. It's actually, um, we, had, we had two different modes. We had a scanner that was kind of a more traditional one, but in, in taking account you know, the fragility and, the, and making sure that we still wanted to you know, not cause any harm to these you know, wonderful books. We had um, a, a 3D, I um, forgot um, the word of it, it's, um, it's touchless, yeah, touchless, con contactless. Scanner. So it was basically we would um, we would consult Julie and ask of how we could best you know, open these. Make sure some of them were very old and fragile, and it was actually just a scanner that would scan it and it would pop up on the computer. And then from then we would have to figure out the color and contrasting. The smaller black one particularly was definitely difficult since the map that you scan on is actually black, and so <laughs> the computer could not pick up the words. And so for that we had to come up with a, a different way to go around it, but yes, thank you for asking. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment. Thank you. Um, thanks, guys. Um, so, uh, so, right, so I, I thought this was a, just a fantastic idea for a project. So, right, so you, you find all these books, you extract their text, you have to have some way of lining up the text so you can see, and no, in this case, translators chose to, uh, to translate this word tov, say that appears at the beginning of the fourth kiddush, uh, as, uh, as good, and in this case, they choose to translate it as pleasing, and so we'll be able to extract categories from those, and have some sense of differences across communities. So, right, to get to your question, the first question, uh, the first 
game that you have to play after you uh, have digital copies of these books is to actually extract the text from them. Now, that's something that I've done a lot in my previous research. Um, so, right, so if you have a book and you photograph all the pages of the book, there is now very good software out there that can extract the text from that book um, in a very high quality sense. Um, so, uh, in fact, I know the UC Library uh, has a partnership with an organization called the Hadi Trust. Um, that it, it, you can go online to the Hadi Trust website and find more than 7 million books that have been scanned into this system and digitized. And what they mean by digitized is that actually Google has provided software that goes through and, and extracts the text from these books, making them uh, re uh, reader searchable. Right, so Google has this text from their, uh, has this program from their Google Books program. They import that same program into the Hadi Trust, and almost every book uh, that's uh, available in a public library and published before the 1920s when copyright hits, it kicks in, almost every book of that type, including the entire collections of the University of California, the University of Michigan, and many other public universities, are available now online through the Hadi Trust. Um, so yeah, so I've, I've used this software, I've found this software very successful. Um, there's a challenge in working with Haggadot, which is that there's both Hebrew and English text. Hebrew OCR is lower quality, but there's a program called Abby, A-B-B-Y-Y, -Y, that uh, has a very good reputation for being able to, uh, to OCR, which is right, object character recognition, so being able to pull the, the text out of these books. So, we scan a bunch of Haggadot, we turn to Abby, Abby spits out in the, uh, the text output of these books, and it is totally illegible. Um, so, it turns out that uh, while there are very nice claims out there about the ability of digitizing dual language Hebrew and English books, uh, I have found that it has been just totally unsuccessful um, in producing readable copies. Um, the, tr the difficulty appears to be Abby's figuring out which parts of the page are Hebrew and which parts are English. What it would tend to do is they would, they would take an English passage and do a great job on it, and then move on to a Hebrew passage and think it was English, and just come up with a whole bunch of garbled nonsense. And then go to an English passage that I thought it was Hebrew and come up with garbled nonsense before finally getting a Hebrew passage right and coming up with some very nice text. Um, so, uh, that's very frustrating. Yes? Yeah, so, right, so, 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 right, so once you end up in a position where you want to uh, uh, recognize characters that you can't uh, work with, there's a couple of possibilities. So, right, so one possibility is only feed in certain parts of the book, maybe it will do a better job. We didn't try that, uh, but we tried with something else, which was uh, we tried going through by hand. Um, and there, there were some passages that had been OCR'd very successfully, so we were able to use those and organize them across books. And then the passages that were not uh, read successfully, we would just type in by hand. Um, and that, it turned out, was arduous. Uh, but, uh, uh, I don't know, we were working with that for a while. Uh, at which point we hit two additional challenges. So this is, the, this is the slide of bad news. This is where I tell you that the Haggadah project, well, I think a very nice idea, uh, was unsuccessful. Uh, before I move on to telling you a, a, a more of a successful project, uh, which uses these translations of the Old Testament. So the so nice thing about the Old Testament that's not nice about Haggadot is that there are a lot of people who are obsessed with the Old Testament, right? People who have literally sat there and just typed in the entire uh, King James translation or other translations, um, such that even though the text is much, much larger, it's also much more available um, to researchers. Nevertheless, sticking with the Haggadot for a moment, once we, sat there, once we actually typed up a lot of this text, the next goal was to align it across Haggadot. And we found, it turns out, much less uh, ability to align these texts than we expected. So, as I found in using multiple Haggadot, Haggadot uh, reorder certain texts to different parts of the book, they omit certain texts uh, in some books that are included elsewhere, they omit, somewhat frustratingly, they also embellish text, which means they take the same prayer that exists in multiple Haggadot and will add Hebrew words to those prayers. Um, for various reasons and in different contexts. And so, so this ruins the goal of these algorithms, which is to find specific contexts and see how multiple translators translate them. If you change the context, or if the translators have some choice, which text to include and which text not to include, then you lose the ability to compare text across multiple books. 
This was a frustration. And then there was a third frustration um, in, uh, in the actual translations themselves. While in the King James Bible, or in, in biblical translations, what you often have is large teams. Right? The King James Bible had a 55-person team who worked uh, assiduously for seven years to translate this uh, uh, full Old and New Testament in that case. For these hundred doubt, you would often have one or maybe two translators. And the translations were done quite quickly. Um, they, they were much less important to the translators than were translations of the Bible. And what this means is that the translations are very literal. Um, I would look through for instances of the word tov, and the word tov was just always translated as the word good. That's unhelpful for this analysis because it doesn't allow for actual categorization across uh, words within these books. So, uh, what we ended up with was these wonderful digitizations, these wonderful, uh, uh, essentially, uh, computer files that represented these really lovely Haggadot for the Magnus's collection, and which, at least in the circumstances where copyright allows, we will be making available to the public uh, through the Magnus's website. Um, what we've ended up with is uh, text data that is not useful for the kind of algorithmic analysis that I would like to conduct. And so, uh, sort of with that uh, inconvenient segue, I'm going to return to the notion of uh, these, these biblical translations, and in particular to the Hebrew word yapha. And so, for these last uh, 15 minutes, I'll just talk you through some findings that you're able to that you can find when you actually do this kind of analysis using 14 translations of the Old Testament. So, in particular, there are five kinds of translations that I'm going to be working with. Uh, well, four kinds, plus the, the origin text. So you've got the actual uh, Hebrew Old Testament, which consists of about 24, 25,000 total verses, right? And those verses are then translated into English or German by various teams of translators. So uh, I'll use an initial set of Bibles from the 16th and 17th century United Kingdom. This is the Geneva Bible, uh, which was a very early translation in the UK, along with the King James Bible, the formal uh, governmental translation of the Old Testament. There are a number of American updates to those early translations, including the JPS 1917 Jewish translation, as well as the New King James Version and uh, the New American Version, uh, which were really just updates of King James. Then you've got what I'm going to call American sui generis Bibles. These are the ones that I really care about. Right? These are where you have a team of translators come in and from scratch, over a period of years, produce a brand new translation of the Bible. What's nice about these translations is that they're done in different places by different groups, but all inside the United States. So we have the Good News Bible, which was a translation by evangelical Christians. You have the, uh, the New World Bible, a translation by the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? A totally different group um, that's outside of the sort of mainstream Christian organizations. You have the, uh, the New American Bible, which is a translation by the Catholic Church. There's no reason to think that these are groups that would like look at each other's translation to see how the other group did it, right? The Jehovah's Witnesses are not at all interested in how the Catholics would choose to translate the Bible or vice versa, and are certainly not going to look at Jewish translations or additional translations. So what's nice about these sui generis Bibles is that we have five cases in which individual and independent groups of translators sat down and performed exactly the same translation act within a 30-year period, where the translation act was to move each of those 25,000 original Old Testament verses into their same vernacular, English. Finally, there are four translations from Germany, uh, the Luther translation of the 16th century and three contemporary translations from the 20th century. Okay, so what does the output from this algorithm look like? It looks like this. So let's uh, stare at this chart for a moment. What you have along both the, the top and the side, you have five Bibles, those three-letter acronyms. Those five Bibles are the five sui generis Bibles that were translated in the United States between 1970 and 2000. And the number that uh, so you can see, sort of, there's, there's one number comparing each pair of Bibles. And that number represents the degree of similarity in the categories of Yafa across those Bibles. So one means that those Bibles are exactly the same, right? That there's absolutely no evidence that the Bibles are using different latent categories in translating this word Yafa. So of course, the New World Translation, the first, uh, first row and first column, 
right, is perfectly similar to itself. Of course, all the Bibles are perfectly similar to themselves. What's interesting about this chart is how similar the Bibles are to each other. So despite the fact that the actual vocabulary used in these different Bibles is different, where one Bible might use good looking, another Bible might use handsome, the categories of objects uh, that are translated in this way across Bibles are almost identical. There are two, different, two uh, exceptions to this. The G and T is the Good News translation. You can see that it is, there's some differences between the Good News translation and uh, two of the other Bibles, NABRE, which is the Catholic Bible, and NWT, the Jehovah's Witness Bible. So what this comes from is a peculiarity of the Good News translation. So the GNT was translated using a philosophy that they call dynamic equivalence. Dynamic equivalence means you're not performing a word-for-word -word translation. Instead, what you're doing is you're performing a general translation. There will be verses that are moved around, phrases that are moved around, phrases that are dropped. It's still always possible to figure out which word corresponds to the Hebrew word yafa, but it's a very imprecise translation. And so what this means is that you end up with some differences between that translation and other groups. What might be surprising is that, is that the differences aren't that big. So in fact, the categories are still almost identical to categories of the two other Protestant Bibles that were translated similarly, uh, in a similar period, and is only somewhat different from, uh, from these two other Bibles translated at the same time. So, so what you're supposed to, I think the sense that you can get from this chart despite the fact that I haven't told you how I actually calculate these numbers, which is uh, omitted from today's talk. What's interesting, I think, about this is how much consistency there is across these American Bibles, which does not occur when you compare Bibles from different times or different places. So this next chart shows consistency between American Bibles and, uh, and British Bibles from the 17th century. So I right, said so the KJV and the ASV are two King James Version 17th century translations of the Bible. And in the box, you can see how those translations compare to contemporary American translations. I chose the Good News translation and the New International Version. And what you see is much bigger differences between the Old and New Bibles than you see within either of those groups. So the Old Bibles are very similar to each other, the New Bibles are very similar to each other, but the Old and New Bibles are quite different from each other. I'll say, I'll, I'll say in a moment how to characterize exactly what those differences are. All this shows you is that there are differences, that the actual categories that latently used in translating the word yafa into nice looking, right, this notion of uh, aesthetic pleasure, are quite different in these two groups. Similarly, if you compare American contemporary versions of the Bible with contemporary German versions of the Old Testament, again, in the box, you see that these are quite different from each other. Now, in this case, uh, the, the first three, the, the, the italicized Bibles are the German Bibles, EU, GMBG, and HFA. You'll see that uh, unlike the contemporary American and the old British translations, the German translations are actually quite different from each other. So while there's a lot of consistency in how Americans translate the Old Testament in the 20th century, in particular in how they translate aesthetic pleasure, that's not the case in contemporary Germany. Um, so, so, right, so the German translations are quite different from each other, but they're also different from the American translations. Right? So there's, there might be no consistency in Germany, but that's not to say that there's any sort of uh, parallel similarity with the states. In fact, they're quite different from the translations in the states. So again, these numbers aren't comparing the entire Bible. All they're doing is extracting these aesthetic categories. And you can see that the aesthetic categories are consistent in the United States, were consistent to some degree in the 17th century Britain, and, uh, and however, are very different both across those groups and within Germany in the 20th century. Okay, two uh, additional points on that. Let's see how we're doing on time, great. So, uh, so the, actually one additional point on that is you might wonder, okay, this is how biblical translators think about aesthetic pleasure but maybe it has nothing to do with how everyone else does, right? So certainly we don't all speak in the same way that our Bible speaks. And so there might be something missing about the representativeness of this information, about the populations that it's, it's intended to represent. So a couple, I think there are a couple of reasons to think that actually this data is quite good in describing uh, how people actually would have thought about these categories in the times at which these Bibles were translated. I think the relevant comparison group 
is with, uh, say, like Google Books, right? I mean, where you have a tremendous number of books, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of books uh, that are just include text from these different times. And you could try to compare how people use different words in different times. Right? So in comparison to Google Books, the, the key difference there is that here, we're all translating exactly the same origin text. In Google Books, you have this problem where people might use words differently, both because the words have different meanings and because they're talking about different things. And so, I don't know, just because the content of what was published changes in the 17th and 20th centuries, for those reasons alone, you end up with differences between these two groups. Moreover, think about exactly what kind of language translators would want to include in these Bibles. Right? So these are Bibles that are translated for as large a general public as possible. The whole goal for translators here is to try to reach as large an audience as possible. So even more true in the 17th century, when uh, despite the fact that most of the population, or maybe about half the population was literate, all of these, the, all, the entire population would have had the Bible read to them every week in church, right? So this is language that has to speak to everyone, it's understandable by everyone. I think we should believe that this language is at least in some sense representative, or the categories represented are in some sense representative of the way that actual people think through these categories. I'm going to conclude by thinking about, okay, we know that the categories are different, right? So there are, there are measurable differences in the ways that we draw those circles for 17th century Britain and contemporary America. What are the differences? What are the actual categories that are being used? So what I've done here is, again, using a mysterious algorithm that won't be today discussed, here's the goal. You, the goal is to find verses that are in some sense similar to the verses that the King James translators uh, grouped together as beautiful. In particular, verses that contain the same kind of language that the beautiful verses contain. Right? So think about it this way. There's 30 instances of Yafa. They are all translated as beautiful by the King James translators. We're going to look to, at verses that have similar language to those. And then this circle on the left, uh, hopefully you can see at least some of it, uh, combines all of the words that tend to appear in verses that the King James translators translated as beautiful. So you can see that most of those words, uh, uh, yad, so the, the name of God, Adonai, house, to come in, these are words that in tendency describe the holy. Right, so it turns out that the King James translators, when they describe things as beautiful, tended to be describing godly things. Whereas alternatively, the second most common word that they used to translate Yafa was fair. And fair described people, not just women and daughters, but also sons and men, he, etc. So the word fair described earthly or, or embodied, personable beauty. Whereas the word beautiful described holy, godly beauty. So you'll notice that this is a different categorization, for instance, than the categorization I presented at the beginning coming from Kant. Right? So Kant had this thought that the way in which we distinguish, the fundamental way in which we distinguish pleasures is between the sensory and the conceptual. That's quite different from what's being described here. The King James translators describe these differences in pleasure as being, on the one hand, holy or godly, and on the other hand, uh, earthly or person. Right? So you can sort of think of Kant as describing a, a sensory or experiential difference, whereas the King James translators had in mind an ethical or metaphysical difference. Right? The relevant distinction in pleasures has to do with the experience of the divine. Alternatively, consider a, a 20th century American translation and perform the same exercise. So the Good News translation most frequently translated Yafa as either beautiful or good-looking, and you can see that in the beautiful case, the word beautiful tended to be used for women, or in a very restricted sense, a couple of men, tendency children. So as the most common words are things like uh, woman, daughter, uh, and mother, to, to give, to come in, etc. There are also a couple of male words in there. Um, but um, alternatively, if you look at the good-looking circle, what you see is, uh, uh, so the, the most frequent word is David. Other words include man, or son, or Israel, right? So these are both, uh, there's a sense in which they are uh, militaristic, nationalistic, right, for David and Israel, but are also just, uh, very strongly male, right? Whereas beautiful 
is in tendency used for either women or young children. The distinction here is gendered. Uh, it, it's the goal, I think, what I at least see in comparing these words. Where, right, whereas in the 17th century, the key differences in the King James Bible have to do with metaphysics, in the 20th century, the key differences that have to do with aesthetic pleasure are across gender, not either metaphysics or experience. And that's a kind of information that I think would be very difficult to obtain without this somewhat elaborate algorithmic analysis of how translators choose to translate words in different contexts in the Old Testament. With that, I'm going to conclude. Um, I think I'm yeah, exactly on time, but happy to answer questions if you have them. So, so right, I sort of, I, I slowly narrowed down the scope of that project and ended up trying to identify sources of uh, almost what I'm going to call natural experiments. So what I'd love to do is like run around the world showing people pictures and say, how do you describe this? How do you describe that? And then compare the ways in which they describe these things. But it turns out you can't go to 18th century Germany and run an experiment like that. So alternatively, you can try to find a, another clever way of getting at that same information. And I claim that this Translation Act is almost exactly that same thing. I don't get to choose what I show them, but they were exactly shown these 70 contexts and were forced to describe them for me as a researcher. And from that, I can extract how they would have responded if I had run an experiment. So, right, sort of running up against the wall of not being able to run this experiment by myself, I stumbled upon this algorithmic technique that would give me the same kind of information about how real people think about beauty that I was unable to get in philosophy. <laughs> How can we convince you to change your major? <laughs> <laughs> so the reason that I ended up in an economics department, so this is challenging, right? Choosing between economics and philosophy. And the question was, should I study with people who are really good empirically and then focus research on something that they don't find interesting? Or alternatively, study something that is, uh, study with people who I think have much clearer ideas about what is interesting and have much closer interests to my own, um, but alternatively have, have just no idea what's happening as soon as I start drawing circles and writing down algorithms. And my choice was that it's probably easier to be in economics and then give cool humanities talks than it is to be in the humanities and try to give cool empirical talks. I, I, what it comes down to is I think uh, humanists, though they may be snobby, aren't as snobby as economists, and that this was sort of the best bet uh, for me to continue doing the research that I actually want to do, given that there is no PhD offered in digital humanities. And, and why are you in economics and not in statistics? Yeah, so th that I was another... Right oh, got it, perfect. I see, I see, oh that's great, so yeah, so I, I thought about it a lot. What it came down to was that I am an applied statistician, and as I was thinking about, okay, who will be the best people to teach me applied statistics? 
I chose economists. I chose the econometricians. Um, so uh, right, I, I have almost no interest in uh, extending theoretical results in statistics. My interest is in finding cool data sets and then modeling the behavior of those data sets. And so yes, yeah, so um, I, I thought about it a lot and decided that economists were the best applied statisticians around and would be the ones who would let me focus the most on actual applied statistics without being burdened by uh, asymptotic proofs. Turns out that economists do a lot of asymptotic proofs too, but, <laughs> but I think I'm better off. Yeah. I, I really found this whole conversation really fascinating. And then, but thinking about, it, there seems to be like, I, I have this sense that there's this very weird arrogance about the translators of the 20th century, especially American Bibles, yeah. and gender, and how, how it's so heavily weighted. And then looking at what Kant thought was beautiful and so on. Sure. It's so different. And yes. It was just like it just it, it, there's there's like an obsession about about roles for gender and yeah. those things, and it seems yeah. really much more narrowly focused and actually not godly. So yeah. I was just wondering if there's any discussion or about the outcomes of those things. I I agree completely. Um, I think this is something that a lot of people have had a sense of for a long time. And standards of evidence in the humanities being as they are, I think it's very difficult to actually end up with a, a concrete claim that is in some sense testable. Given, right, people's notion that uh, gender seems to appear much more in, uh, for instance, uh, contemporary writing, contemporary translation, contemporary culture, wherever it is, than it may have in the 17th century. I, in the end, but it's, it's, it's going to have to come down to is that I don't think I have very good insight into that literature, into um, ways in which other people have, had, have <coughs> attempted to identify or distinguish um, these sort of broad cultural norm differences in these different groups. Does that um, happen in both, both secular and the, the sacred texts? That's a good question. I mean, I just wondered if, if people right. are using these words specifically in a religious yeah. Secular, like, even the same translators may do it Absolutely. So the only insight I could give into that, just because my data is limited to biblical translation, is to note the tremendous diversity of text in the Bible. So, for instance, uh, 15 instances out of the 70 of the word Yafa in the Old Testament occur in the Song of Songs. And the Song of Songs is love poetry. Um, and, uh, and so the, the, the best answer that I can give is that, in fact, I think there are a lot of different kinds of text in the Old Testament, a lot of different ways for these words to be used. I think that there is, then, for, for that reason, a lot of identificatory power here, a lot of ways of describing not how people use this language in very narrow contexts, but instead how they use it in many different contexts to, uh, to try to model as broadly as possible the latent categories that are below those decisions. Um, so, uh, so, however, uh, right, I think the, the, the broader point here is that it's, it's unclear exactly how representative this language is of the public. And, and right, so I, I, I'm doing my best, sort of scouring my mind for ways of finding information about, how, so you know, I've gotten from the six philosophers to the hundreds of translators um, who were performing an act that was supposed to be for everyone, even if maybe it wasn't, as you're saying. So right, the, the next step is to find data that is even more representative, it's even closer to the way that real people think, right, or, or the majority of people think. And, and I agree that I, 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 while I'm one step closer to that, and I think I'm one step closer than a, a lot of literature on that question, um, it, it's certainly imperfect. Yeah? Do we know anything about how teams of translators negotiate their final decisions? Yeah. So uh, here's, here's, here's one anecdote. So, uh, so the King James translation took seven years. Um, and the way it worked is that they split the Old Testament into three parts. Um, and each part was sent to a different part of England. Uh, Oxford, Cambridge, and Westminster were the three translation teams. And, uh, and so those translation teams would translate that segment. There were like 20 people in each team. 
and then they would rotate once and argue over the translation decisions of the other teams. Right? So everyone translates together uh, and then rotates once and talks about the other translations. So um, at the Bodleian Library at Oxford, there is a copy of the Geneva Bible, uh, sorry, the Bishop's Bible, which was an, uh, a 1580s translation, uh, so it was like 25 years earlier than the King James, that was condoned by the crown, but was ultimately conceived, it, it was perceived as being uh, uh, insufficient, for which reason they called the King James Committee. There's a copy of the Bishop's Bible with uh, notes of the translators as they were arguing over the decisions at Oxford of the Westminster translators. So what you have is you'll have like a little uh, a line uh, over, the, say, the word uh, good. And then you'll have four other words listed as other possibilities. And three of them are crossed off. And the word that was not crossed off is the one that actually ends up in the King James. Um, so I, uh, I have not, I've seen, so if you go online, you can see pages of this book. Um, but uh, for reasons that are I think, very easy to believe, um, the book is, is uh, uh, fragile. Um, and uh, is, has not been fully digitized. I have worked hard to find funding to either digitize it or go over there and digitize it myself or somehow get a microfiche copy here. Um, and uh, and uh, I don't know, so far that, that project has been unsuccessful. But I think that would be a really useful way to, to get, I think, very concrete evidence of the amount of work that went word for word into this translation act. Um, and yeah, that's the only instance I know where there's really a tremendous amount of information directly about the, uh, uh, the actual translation act of the King James translators that would be relevant for this. Yeah. So I, just go. I just wanted to commend all of you also for sharing your process and sharing the moments of failure. Yes. And I think that in itself is a great result of a research team. I agree completely. And uh, it very much explains why we do what we do here. Yeah. And uh, so I, you know, on, on a personal note, just the idea of like the social engineering of putting the three of you together yeah. uh, to, and allow you space and some resources to do work and also to learn from the failure. And, and you know, I mean, the basic knowledge that of course the Magnus is not Google, yeah. but uh, that we knew before. Sure, but, uh, sure. But um, that actually teaches us a lot of things in terms of what we can do and how we can learn. Totally and how agree. We can research in the future. Yes. But in general, that the social engineering of putting a, a, a research team together yeah. and uh, also discovering things or like simply learning that you guys are doing things that are completely outside of my scope. Sure. This sure. is really just wonderful and fascinating. So I'm, I'm also on a personal note. And it's true, and I owe a tremendous thank you to the Magnus Collection for both making these documents available, for putting together this team so that I could work with a couple of undergraduates and sort of run this project to completion. It turned out that the Haggadahs were more difficult than we expected. Um, I learned tremendously from that. Um, I think there's still a lot of ways for it in some sense to move forward. And yeah, I don't know, it's, it's, it's been a very convenient, I think for all groups, and very uh, positive uh, connection. I don't know, I, I, I have a tremendous thank you to the Magnus. Thank you again. Great, thank you.